Five reasons your photos are not sharp. Man, your photos aren't coming out sharp and you're not sure why. Well, unfortunately, this honing steel will not help sharpen your photos, but I've got four tips for you so you don't have blurry photos anymore. Hello, my name is Mike Lloyd. I am a professional photographer. I've been doing it for 12 years and teaching for the last decade. I'm not gonna wave the knife around anymore. I don't wanna hurt myself while I'm talking to you. But I got really good at taking sharp photos and it wasn't always the case. I've definitely had my instances of blurry images and I'm gonna share what I've learned with you so you don't F up like I did. So there's basically four reasons you probably have blurry photos. I'm gonna tell you how to sharpen them. The first one, motion blur. Number two is high ISO. Number three, missing your focus. And number four, an uncalibrated lens. So number one is motion blur. This is when an object in the frame that you are photographing is moving faster than the shutter speed is able to freeze. Essentially, the faster an object moves in your frame, the faster your shutter speed needs to be in order to freeze that motion. So you've probably seen examples of waterfalls or a river where the water is falling and it looks like cotton candy. That is motion blur. Or you've seen a race car where the car is totally crisp and clean, but the background is like blurred streaking behind it, that's motion blur. Because as the camera moves with the race car, they're effectively, the, the camera is effectively making it so the race car is not moving, but the background is moving. Or if the camera is looking forward and the race car moves past the scene, you need to take a picture fast enough to freeze that motion when the race car is in the frame, which is tricky to do. But if you don't do it right and your shutter speed isn't fast enough, the race car will look blurry. This can also happen if your focus mode isn't properly set for whatever it is you're photographing. If you're using one shot focus mode, meaning you push the button to take a picture, it focuses, then takes the photo, but your object is moving, your camera has just enough of a delay between focusing and taking the photo that that object will have moved out of your plane of focus. If you are on servo mode, which is the recommended mode for photographing a moving object or continuous focus as it's called in some camera brands, that is specifically designed for it. So consider your focus mode, consider your shutter speed if you are photographing objects that are moving. This video will not go into extreme technical detail on how all those things work and why they work, but just know that is an option. Motion blur could be why your photos aren't as sharp as you'd like them to be. Same goes is if maybe you're photographing something that's still, but it's, it's not quite as sharp. If your shutter speed is so slow that your hand movements are causing it, that is also motion blur. Obviously everyone has a different threshold, but we don't wanna hand hold a photo, uh, hand hold the camera and take a photo slower than 1 60th of a second. If your shutter speed is any slower than that, you're gonna get handshake in your image, most likely. Some people can get down to 1 30, other people can't go any slower than 1 60th. Uh, 160th, I should say. So it just depends on how stable you are and your hands for taking the photo, how stable the object is, and the more movement there is, you need to be on faster shutter speeds and continuous focus mode. All right, number two, your ISO is up too high. The way the image sensor works is it's made of a, a grid of pixels. It's not a solid sheet of data. That's why when we brighten up a raw file or a JPEG, you end up with film grain, the spots everywhere. Those are the pixels. And what happens is the computer inside of your camera, the processor chip or the editing software that you're using has to fill in the data between the pixels. So what it does is it analyzes what the pixels around it are doing and it plugs in data that it believes should exist between those pixels. When your ISO is up too high, you don't have enough data to make a good decision as to what should be in those pixels and we end up with grain in our digital images. Film grain is a normal part of photography, nothing wrong with that. But in digital, we get the grain when the ISO is up too high, which also means our images won't look 
as sharp because we don't have the same hard defined lines and contrast we do when our ISO is down lower. Now, what does low and high ISO look like? Well, low is 100, low could be 400, low could be 1000. It depends on your image sensor inside your camera. Full frame cameras, medium formats, they can go up much higher before you start to see degraded image quality. Whereas an APS-C sensor or an Olympus Micro Four Thirds, you get above 400 ISO and you're already gonna see a ton of film grain. So this is a thing that you gotta play with and see what is an acceptable level of grain for you because it will take away sharpness from your images when they are blown up. Number three is missing your focus. Now, I know I touched a little bit of this on the motion blur segment where something is moving too fast and your camera can't focus on it. That is one thing. I did a shoot maybe eight, nine years ago where I had just bought my first Canon full frame. I got the 5D Mark II. It was like the latest, greatest thing. And I got a 135 millimeter F2 L lens. This was a beautiful portrait lens. And I was so stoked. I went out and did a whole shoot with this lens, just this lens so I could figure out what it does. And I shot the whole thing at F2 because I could, I never had a lens that opened up that wide up until that point. So I was so stoked for just this buttery smooth bokeh. It was beautiful for portraits and the stuff that, that I was doing out there that day. Thankfully, it was not a client shoot, which is for funsies with a model. So when I got home and looked at all the photos and none of them were in focus, I didn't have to refund anyone or reshoot anything. I could just, you know, do the best I can, apologize to the model, and we ended up shooting again later for funsies anyway. But I had no idea how shallow a depth of field was at f2 at 135 millimeter lens. Again, this isn't a really technical video to go into explaining how depth of field works and what, what things influence it, but generally, the wider open your aperture and the longer your focal length is, the shallower your depth of field is going to be. So if I photograph or if I focus on somebody's eyeball and they take too big a breath in, that could move them out of the focal plane with this particular lens at those settings. Or if I have to recompose an image because maybe I chose the middle focus point on my camera, but that's not how I wanna compose the image. So I focus and then I move the camera down slightly to get the composition I want. That could move their eyeballs out of the focal plane. Now with the mirrorless cameras, there are hundreds and hundreds of focal points. I don't have to worry about doing that anymore. But with the other cameras, we did. And even still, you might move enough with your camera or your subject could move enough to miss that focus. So be mindful of your limitations. If you're gonna shoot with a very, very shallow depth of field, make sure you are able to maintain that focus and shoot with the right tools and technology that allows you to nail that. So what I like to do is use a tape measure. You could use a yardstick, ruler, meter stick, whatever you've got, and set it down on a table going away from you. And this is important because you're having little marks on there that dictate distance away from your camera. Hold up your camera, focus in on one particular point. Maybe it's the one foot mark, maybe it's the 30 centimeter mark. Whatever point you choose on there, focus on that and take the photo. Then go back and look at the photo and find out how close you were at nailing your focus. Because if you notice that you're consistently on that mark that you photographed on, and you'll know because your depth of field is shallow, so maybe this 24 inch mark is razor sharp in focus, and then you get blurry as you move away, you'll know based on where it is sharp as to how accurate you were with your focus. If you can consistently nail that focal point, then you should feel pretty comfortable photographing somebody with those settings. If you can't nail that point on there, then I would close down your aperture a little bit and don't shoot with quite as shallow a depth of field because you can still get beautiful portraits at f2.8, at f3.5, maybe f1.2 isn't where you should be. Practice, stick your camera on a tripod, but do this as a good test to find out how accurate you are. All right, lastly, your lens might not be calibrated or you just don't have a sharp lens. When Sigma came out with their art lenses several years ago, they got so much height. And I've spoken with so many photographers who bought them, specifically the 35 millimeter art lens, and they just weren't sharp. 
which was a bummer because they, they weren't super cheap and a lot of us bought them. So we ended up, you know, selling them to amateur photographers or people who didn't need razor sharp focus like we do as professionals. But even with the Canon L series lenses, I had issues where the images just weren't as sharp as I wanted them to be. They were plenty sharp for my clients' preferences to do large wall art, but I want everything to be 100% perfect. And that was really difficult for me to accept that the photos weren't totally sharp like I hoped hoped. So the lens may not be sharp. You could be at the extreme ends of the aperture shooting at f1.2 or f16 or 22 because also when you're at the extreme ends of an aperture opening, whether it's all the way opened up or all the way closed down, your image will not be as sharp as if you are in the middle. f8 will always be sharper than f1.2 or f22. That's just how the lens works. The farther to an extreme you push it, the less sharp your image will be. But I don't want to shoot at f8. I want to shoot at f1.2 or f1.8. So you have to choose a lens that is sharp at that focal length. So again, it could be the lens or maybe your lens was super sharp, but now it's not sharp anymore. You can calibrate your lenses. So go back to your ruler, your tape measurer, or you could download uh, these calibration sheets off the internet and print one out if you'd like to, but this is a great, great tool. You put your camera on a tripod, you focus on one point, you take the photo, and then you see how accurately did it nail that focus. Because maybe it's consistently focusing a little too far away or a little bit too close. You can go into your camera's lens profile settings and every camera is different. So look it up in your user manual. I know the one time we actually look in our user manual and you can set profiles for each lens that you use and your camera will communicate with your lens and say, okay, cool. Every time that we're working together, the camera and the lens, I want you to pretend that I'm focusing on something just a little bit closer because you're, you're focused too far back. So move that in just a little bit. And then take the photo, test your, your calibration, and see if you've got it dialed in. I'll go through all of my lenses, camera off and on again, you know, let it warm back up, and then I'll bring the ruler back out, and I will do it again and just find out. Because some lenses I've done this with, and it doesn't matter how many times I calibrate them, they're not sharp. So it could just be the lens. It could be that I have unrealistic expectations, as you might as well. There are a lot of factors in there. But I'd say if you can calibrate your lens using a ruler or tape measure, that is going to get you really, really, really close to, to perfect, as perfect as we can get it. All right, so those are the four ways that you can sharpen your photos if you're ending up with a bit of blur in your images. Number one is controlling motion blur. Make sure your shutter speed is fast enough and your focus mode is correct for whatever you are photographing. Number two, your ISO might be too high, so make sure it is low enough to maintain all of the detail that you want in your images. Number three, you could just be missing your focus. You might just be trying to use too aggressive a depth of field for your ability level to control that depth of field. And number four, your lens might not be calibrated or it might not be able to be calibrated to be sharp enough to meet your expectations, which is fine too. This is why I always recommend renting equipment before you buy it. Now, given if something is rented and used, it might not perform the same out of the box. And I could buy 10 different identical lenses and they're all gonna perform just a little bit differently because that's how every Everything is in life. So renting it though will give you a really good idea of what to expect. And then when you buy one, you can apply that rental credit toward the purchase in most locations, most stores. Uh, so it's not actually costing you any extra money. So that's what I recommend doing. And if you're like, cool, I got some sharp photos now. I want to take some dramatic moody photos. So I've got this other video linked for you down below, how to shoot dark and moody boudoir photos, where I walk you through how I do my personal style of boudoir, the dark, dramatic, and moody. I freaking love it, and I hope you do as well. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. I think doing that will make your photos a little bit more sharp also. So consider that a bonus tip for the day. And if you have any questions about any of this, post them down in the comments, or actually head to the boudoir Guild's Facebook group, and we'd be happy to help you out over there. You are amazing. See you inside.